Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to No Signal. We're back, everyone. I know I missed last week, and I feel like I've been away for so long. I was busy all last weekend doing some family stuff, didn't get time to record, and didn't really get a lot of time to see any new movies, uh, except for Joker Fully Ado, which I will talk about. And after that, I, I don't want to talk about these Joker movies ever again, and I never want to think about them ever again, but I do have some thoughts. Uh, yeah, so I did like a kind of a speed run of a lot of movies this past weekend, and, you know, um, stuff that I was really excited to see um, in that time of year where all the award stuff is coming out, so it feels like every weekend it's just a big... Uh, big high profile movie in the awards circuit that I'm really excited to see. So, I'm gonna talk about some of that stuff. But before we get to that, I guess I'll just do I got like a little rant that I want to go on about the, the current state of film discourse and kind of my thoughts around where things are at. I just randomly have the discussing film twitter open on my screen if you're watching the video version but not related i love discussing film we love discussing film here uh but yeah you know i i kind of have a lot of thoughts about you know um we have an election coming up in america in the next couple of weeks and so political discourse has been taking up a lot of my feed and a lot of what i've been paying attention to right now because i'm interested in all different types of content on the internet uh, but, you know, it always feels like that no matter what niche you are or what space or what community you are occupying in the internet, there's always, you know, politics, um, which is to a degree, I uh, imagine just natural and that's fine, but it seems like they're like the culture war is omnipresent in every single community basically whether it be um any kind of entertainment uh film music gaming um you you can't get away from the culture war no matter what space you're occupying in on the internet these days and you know in in and it's no different in on like film twitter or film youtube you, you can't escape the the culture war and the grifter types and people complaining about everything being woke in media it's everywhere um you know but and i try not to get i really don't have any interest in you know talking about the issues around what's wrong with like film discourse and things like that or everything being woke I don't know if it's like this in gaming, but what I feel like I, I like to um, think about when I think about what space I'm occupying in like, you know, my 200 subscriber channel that hopefully will grow um, as I do more long term, you know, long form projects that I'm working on is I, I feel like I really don't want to occupy even the same space that a lot of like quote unquote movie grifters operate in. Does that make sense? I feel like I am not even, you know, even if my channel grows, I feel like I'm not even going to be in the same sphere as where like the, the right wing grifters of movie YouTube are because I think the reasoning for that is is basically a lot of like the the grifter types talking about you know how every movie is woke now or movies are terrible or yada 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 they don't talk about the things that I'm interested in really they, all of these people only talk about Marvel and Disney and superhero stuff you know it's like a very small small margin of what's actually out there in like you know in in modern filmmaking 
it's or or tv or entertainment you know and specifically those two mediums is so and i'm personally just really not interested in talking about that stuff anymore i mean occasionally if there's something superhero related i i you know i'm not above it i'm not saying i'm superior i'll watch it and talk about it but like i'm i'm not interested in watching marvel movies anymore or like star wars is just not great now and i don't care about it's it's too exhausting to talk about these things like like i I can give up star wars and live such a healthier life (laughs) it's not worth it i don't hold star wars that near and dear to me i never did uh you know so i'm just i'm not consuming that media because especially there's so much other movies out there you think any of like right-wing grifter youtube is going to be talking about like anora you know i just i just feel like i guess i just feel better knowing that I just feel like I'm in a completely different space than a lot of these people and their audiences. And, and they're not that there's a problem with, with, you know, being someone that's just more dedicated to comic book and big franchise stuff. That's totally cool. Um, it's just not what I'm interested in. And, you know, so I just feel like a lot of these right-wing grifters that are just complaining about everything being woke and terrible are watching just Disney stuff and just Marvel stuff that I don't really care about and I don't think their audiences care about anything else but that so like I don't consider them to be like really into films and movies so much more as they're just more into big franchise stuff And again, that's fine. I just feel like I'm not even in the same, I'm not even in the same like space as them where, where my interests are, you know? So I don't, I don't know if it's like that with gaming. I I don't know if it's like that with music, but that's where I'm at. But, but when it comes to a lot of, like a lot of things I see on Twitter, just not even the grifter, grifter stuff aside. When I'm seeing conversations specifically on Twitter about, you know, movies and things that are coming out and just basically whatever is being quote tweeted by discussing film, I just, I feel like people so often, and the grifters do this too, where they talk about films and movies where like they have to back up what they're saying by providing like box office facts or you know what do the fans think of this or uh, is there a fandom around this or you know they're betraying the fans and i just feel like this is a really weird way of talking about art you know i don't care if there's fans for something i don't care if a movie makes money or doesn't make money that's not my job to care about that if there's like a small indie movie that i really like and it makes a shit ton of money that's great but if i come out of anora and say it's like one of the greatest movies i've ever seen and it doesn't do well financially i mean sure that kind of sucks in the abstract but as a consumer i don't really care because I got a great movie that I love. And and sure, oh, well then Sean Baker won't be able to get his next projects funded. And I, and I get that. But so much less of the conversation now is, hey, what'd you think about the movie? Did you like it? Did you? Like, it's more about creating a narrative around a project instead of just, you know, insightfully um and articulate articulately articulately god i can't say that word uh expressing your opinions on something it's it's not about that anymore it's like you have to create a narrative been like well this thing made a billion dollars and this one crashed at the box office so and it's like i'm not a fucking film executive why is everyone 
talking like they're a film executive. And I, and I get, you know, broadly, these are, these are interesting conversations to have and be like, oh, well, this, you know, project didn't do well when it came out or, you know, this person is struggling to get funding for the next project. Th those conversations can be had, but it, it, no longer is anyone interested in like, oh, what did, what did you think of it? Like they need their opinions validated or invalidated when it's just your experience with a film. What did you, what did you take away from it? It's like everyone now has to think like they're a fucking executive. And I think some of that has to do with like franchises and, you know, everyone's like, has to be like, uh, like an analyst of the box office and, uh, you know, casting rumors and, and arguing about movies that aren't going to be coming out supposedly for like another six or seven years. You know, there's already controversies and things about it. It's just, it's just not what I'm interested in talking about. Like if I listen to a podcast about people talking about, you know, movies and films, I want them to talk about the movie, you know, on Twitter. Now, all you just see is like, they need to build a narrative. Well, like, well, the fans hated this. Well, you know, there were no fans for this. No one watched this show. I, I don't, I don't give a fuck about anyone else. <laughs> I'd rather hear, like, I like listening to people articulate and express what they enjoyed or what they didn't enjoy about a film. But it seems more now they have to like create some narrative been like, well, they were stupid to spend this money on this project. This is just a complete bomb and it was, it was stupid and they just made it. They just totally fucked up and they don't know what they're doing. I mean, sure, but why is that your concern? <laughs> like you're not the one working at these studios and every, I just, I just think they're the most boring conversations that are being had right now and i don't know i guess shout out to i like when i am talking about a movie that i saw you know i don't consider myself a critic and i have no aspirations to be considered one um I, you know and that's a big reason why i don't say that my videos are reviews uh i just have a i have a whole philosophy around that and what i want to do online i would you know i i just want to be able to talk about what i liked and what i didn't like about a movie can you call that that a review sure but do I, would i ever want to be called a critic absolutely not um because i have a lot of respect for really good critics um and i don't think i'm doing what they do i'm unscripted speaking off the top of my head off the cuff uh you know there are some really good reviewers that spend a lot of time you know, scripting their videos and trying to write a good review. Uh, and I think they're few and far between, to be honest. Uh, but I'd rather, you know, just me just giving my thoughts on the newer movies that I've seen. I, I kind of just want that to be a side thing of my channel. I want once, um, you know, some things in my life get a little updated and my situation changes a little bit maybe like in the you know in the in the next year or so uh i, I want to be doing a lot more bigger projects uh there, there's a lot of other creators on the internet that i that i would strive to to be like uh you know i have my own vision for what i want my channel to be and what kind of video essay type genre stuff i, I would like to make on the platform and i think just these quick just, hey, here's what I thought about this new movie that I saw. Would Let's be honest, it would help with the algorithm. That's what the trailer reactions are for, even though they're very fun. Um, but, but yeah. Um, anyway, that's just a whole rant. Uh, I, I hope <laughs> anyone that's, that's listening, um, hopefully there's someone out there that feels this exact same way who's seeing this on the internet now. Because it's really sad. I mean, I, look, I listen to, not to say that there's not still great people out there, <laughs> I listen to some great podcasts and some great creators. Uh, I mean, shit, I'll shout out a few. I love Sardonicast, uh, YMS and IHE. I love Show Me the Meaning, Just Came Back, Wisecrack, uh, Raymond Kramer, and Austin Hayden. Those guys are a great duo. Um, the Critically Acclaimed Network, William Bibliani and Whitney Seibel. Those guys are great. Uh, I enjoy Blank Check with Griffin and David. Um, I even think the big picture, why they're not like my favorite, just as far as like, I don't know how to put it. Just, um, they're good. I like, they, they, they do really good work. Um, 
yeah, so there's a lot of great shows and podcasts and things like that that are um, really good at just exploring what they think about movies and what they enjoy about them. And, uh, you know, again, not like the, the conversations of box offices and studios don't come up. I think those conversations can be interesting, but they're not being used to validate or invalidate an opinion, you know, uh, because I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> I'm confident. Like it's, it's not again, I, how this has to be stated anymore is ridiculous. And if you need this stated for you, your, this channel probably isn't for you, but it, yeah, man, all this shit's subjective. <laughs> and, and if you need to care about what your favorite movie, how it did in the, how it did in the box office or how it's being reviewed critically. I mean, maybe just gain some more confidence in your own opinions. I, I, I don't know. Like you, you, it's, these aren't debates. They're, they're your experience with a movie, if, whether you enjoyed it or not. <laughs> I just, I just wish, wish this wouldn't become such a thing. Uh, where everyone has to feel like their opinions need to be validated or invalidated. Uh, so, yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, all right. I Let's get on with the show. Uh, got quite a few movies we're going to be talking about today, folks. So, um, yeah, we're deep in October now. So, let's get into it. Joker. Fully Ado, the sequel to the notorious, what is it, 2019, 2018, uh, Joker with Joaquin Phoenix, in which he won the Oscar for, you know, the, the, the school shooter movie, the incel movie, whatever. Uh, I didn't care for the first Joker movie. I thought. It was pretty shallow with what it was trying to say and the way it was presented made it seem like it was it was making this big profound statement about mental health uh, and I just thought it was pretty surface level um, you know one scene where the therapist is saying they cut the funding they don't care about people like you I mean, it's not a bad message, I guess, but it's not the the way the movie it's presenting it, like it's some deep fucking thing. I, I don't I just it's it's whatever. Um and the weird uh you know, like pandering including like all of the Batman stuff, uh the Bruce Wayne stuff, the Thomas Wayne stuff, very shoehorned in. Uh I feel like this could have been a good movie as an original idea. It felt like it didn't need to be based off of the Joker at all at its core. But then again, if you do that, then you're essentially just remaking the King of Comedy, aren't you, Todd Phillips? And I know he's completely aware of that. Martin Scorsese is a producer on the first Joker movie, his name is on it, so what are you going to do? But yeah, so, you know, I thought it looked great. I thought Joaquin Phoenix gave a great performance. I think it's a little annoying that for him to win an Oscar, he had to play Joker, which, you know, and I, Heath Ledger's Joker is a perform, performance as the Joker, one of my favorite performances of all time. I'm not going to act like that's, you know, I, I still hold that belief, so that's cool. Um just a weird thing about the joker man uh like this rite of passage to be a great actor you have to play the joker but anyway uh so i went and saw this second movie for uh, mainly just because of the the wild developments around it where you know adding lady gaga to be harley quinn saying it was going to be a musical doing something totally different I was really interested in that idea. Uh, and so, now we have Joker Folia Do. Uh, and it's, it's people fucking hate it. Uh, yeah, I, I think Joker Folia Do is better than the first movie. Uh, 
because I think it's doing some more interesting things. I think, you know, it's... Again, a lot of this just comes down to, like, the messaging of the movie, because the messaging is pretty in-your-face, in my opinion, uh, from what I saw. Um, still doesn't make it a great movie. I think the entire first hour of this movie is very boring. Uh, mainly just in a prison, Joaquin Phoenix just getting introduced to Lady Gaga. The, the movie doesn't really do anything for the first hour. Uh, they don't... I, I really hated that they didn't commit to the musical aspects of the movie. They're doing this... Um, Oh, there was another movie that did, that did this recently that I have in my mind. Um, I think I was telling my friends, uh, not all of the Disney remakes. Uh, John Favreau's The Jungle Book, I remember, did this where they do this thing where like they kind of go into like the songs, but they do like talk singing where they're kind of just kind of halfway singing songs but there's not like really full musical numbers there's maybe like one or two in the movie but other than that the breaking out into song in this movie is very just here and there like kind of talk singing and there's only like one or two points where lady gaga is clearly singing with her full voice Everyone's referring to, like, there's specifically two lines where she's actually using her full voice. And when people are referring to that, I immediately know what two lines they're talking about, where you actually get full Gaga. So that was a huge disappointment in the movie. Uh, yeah, again, I think there's interesting things about this movie. I think it's a better movie than the first Joker movie. You know, all I can really say positively about the first Joker movie, aside from the production and how it looks and the performance... Uh, the performance is, uh, there was a few cool scenes of tension. But other than that, King of, King of Comedy is one of my favorite Scorsese's and one of my favorite movies of all time. I just, it's just too derivative uh, and just doesn't really have much to say. And I just couldn't help but feel like this is like, I shouldn't even say a movie made for people who only watch comic book movies that have never seen an indie movie before it feels like a movie made for people who only go to comic book movies who have never seen another movie before <laughs> you know i mean uh, it just it's it, and, and and i'm not even like trying to shit on like comic book audiences it's that the it's just the the way these movies present themselves is so profound and so it's like, but why you don't need to be a Joker movie for this? Um, God forbid you create an original character. But what the fuck do I know? Um, so yeah. Uh, so Joker fully ado. First hour, very boring. It felt like there didn't really need, they didn't really have a full story in mind for something like this. I think what was really annoying, uh, Joker being having this uh counselor with him trying to present this defense of him for his court case of like oh he has like a dual personality he's he's not it wasn't him it wasn't arthur fleck doing all of this it was joker it, it just it, this whole like dual personality thing yes of course it's like a real mental illness but just like for the edgelord kind of crowd it's like she might as well have just been saying, like, I feel like I'm being taken back to, like, the 2010s of, like, it wasn't Eminem who did this. It was Slim Shady. You get it? You get it? It's just fucked up, man. They just have these alternative personas that are just wild and crazy. It just, oh, God, I was, like, so annoyed when that idea started to come into the movie. Um, and then... You know, it's the last 30 minutes that a lot of people hate. But I actually think was really good. Uh, I really, really liked... I thought the courtroom stuff started to pick up. I thought that was getting kind of interesting. Or I should... There were some scenes where I was laughing so hard during the courtroom scene. And I'm legitimately wondering whether or not the movie is in on the joke 
in the sense that I think the movie might have been in on the joke. When it hard cuts to the next day in the court and Joaquin Phoenix is just sitting there in full Joker makeup and the judge is like, I'll allow it. <laughs> it just felt like the, the Joker meme of like, he might as well have just been sitting there like hard cut when it hard cut to him in Joker makeup for like no reason in the in the courtroom. I, I lost it. I lost it so hard. <laughs> I just thought of like the meme of like Joker staring in the mirror with like the Nike zip up. Oh, man, that got me so good. And I and I really am wondering in hindsight if that was. And then, what? of course, when he goes into, like, the whole, like, foghorn, leghorn voice for, like, ten minutes, I was genuinely thinking, am I in on the joke on this? Uh, so there was that. And then the movie started to take a turn where I actually was really enjoying it. I really was not expecting uh, Arthur Fleck to reject the idea of the Joker and say, hey no, this wasn't the Joker. This was me who did this. I did all of this. I killed those men, you know? And that's the thing, too, about the movie. It is, like, just kind of literally retreading the entire first movie. Uh, but whatever. So, but I did really admire that, and I did like that, where, and, and you know, he ends up feeling betrayed or, or Lady Gaga feels betrayed by him, he kind of turns his back on all of it and says, no, I'm just a legitimately sick person that did a lot of bad things, and he's just rejecting this whole idea of being the Joker. And I really loved that. And it's clearly a big fuck you to all the people that liked the first Joker movie. And I'm... I'm I'm at two minds with this. Now, again, these are like the few things I think about the movie that are good. Again, all of my crit I don't think this is like a great movie or anything. I think it's better and more interesting than the first one for the reasons I listed, but it still is like not great. I'm prefacing all of that with the issues I listed previously. Uh, I, I really liked that at the end, you know, it just ends with him sitting in jail and they say, hey, you got a visitor. And I'm like, oh no, are they, they're going to do like a, it's like every, it's like, I'm like, oh no, it's like the end of every superhero movie where it's like, oh, who is it? It's like Mr. Freeze is going to be there to visit him or the Riddler, you know, and it's going to be like a tease. And then when he stops in the hallway and that guy says, hey, Arthur to him, I'm like, right before, right when they did that, I was like, oh, thank God they're just going to kill him. It, and, like, that almost felt like a troll, you know? Where it's, like, they're going to do the thing where they do in every other superhero movie where it's, like, he's, oh, you got a visitor and it's going to be, like, some other villain. But no, they just fucking kill him. The way they even did that felt like a fuck you. And I fucking loved that. Now, the thing that people are saying where the guy who stabbed him then, like, cut his face like Heath Ledger's Joker, I didn't catch that. I mean, that's kind of, ugh, whatever. I mean, it's there. I, I didn't, honestly, I, I genuinely just didn't see it. But I mean, I believe it. I just, I don't know. Uh, whatever, it's a little weird. Um, but, so yeah, I really did appreciate and was genuinely not expecting it to go in that direction. So that was a cool last 30 minutes. I, I when it started, the minute Arthur Fleck in the courtroom admitted to just doing everything and dropping it and being like, no, this all this Joker stuff is ridiculous. I really, really loved that. But that was about it. Uh, and so then the question becomes, okay, Todd Phillips is saying fuck you to all of the people that liked the first Joker movie. Cool. And the reason why it seems like he's doing that is because of the narrative that came out from the first Joker movie you know, of people hijacking at the media, talking about it. it's like the incel movie, it's, you know, making all of, like, the wrong, it's giving all the wrong messages and things like that. It basically got co-opted the entire movie by, like, the this red pill 
incel community or that was the meme of the movie what have you he was he was clearly rejecting the reputation of the first joker movie but then in my mind i also think to myself well sure i think it's cool that todd phillips took an artistic stand and actually gave you a vision that he had to say fuck you to the fans even though this vision might have been kind of half-assed and not really deserving of a full movie i also think well dude you're still the one that made the first joker movie and i understand like death of the author i'm not it's not just the reputation that the first joker movie got I just think the first Joker movie is genuinely not good. So it's not even that, like, so you you still made kind of this pretentious first Joker movie. I don't know. I just, I just don't know how much credit I'm going to give him for this, you know? Uh, so, yeah. Um, I mean, that's all I, I really got to say about it. I, again, I do think it's really interesting. Went in an inter- interesting direction whole first half is completely boring and they should have committed more to the musical elements of it and didn't use lady gaga enough you get gaga and you barely have her sing or do any you know real fun musical numbers you can make musical numbers really fun one of my favorite movies uh jim carrey's the mask one of the best scenes in that movie is is the dance club scene with the uh, the coco bongo you know so it's like it's not like you have to be you know so poison with musical numbers you can make really great musical numbers but they didn't really have an interest in doing that they just didn't fully commit so yeah that's that's joker fully ado there we did it i talked about it i never want to think about this movie either of these movies or talk about them ever again moving on next i saw fancy dance starring Lily Gladstone coming off of the amazing Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, yeah, this was an Apple TV Plus original, and uh, I just saw Lily Gladstone was starring in it, so just threw it on to check it out. And uh, this was a pretty great indie road trip movie uh, dealing with a lot of issues about modern reservation culture that i'm not really familiar with this really reminds me of that other jeremy renner movie is it is it wind river i believe yes kind of dealing with the same subject matter of issues with like trafficking and drugs and crime uh within you know you know american reservation culture uh so yeah very interesting subject matter very interesting story I think uh, it's it's just a really uh, exactly what you would expect about or expect from an like an indie road trip movie. You know, you got these two characters, uh, family members. They they go on this little journey. You, you know, there's conflict. They discover things about each other. Um, you know, about exploring the issues in their their current environment uh and you know what's being ignored and and it's just a very a very uh touching story the end of the third act had a little bit of a not a twist but it you know something happened where i was like oh wasn't expecting that and then you know i thought it ended um in a pretty beautiful way i think so much of this movie is you know, just being elevated by Lily Gladstone here, who just is such a fantastic actor. I mean, she really just has one of those talents of how much she is able to express from her face, like just her face, her facial expressions. Uh, So much of this movie is just focusing on her face. And that was what was one of the things that was so great about killers of the flower moon and her character in that movie she's just so such a an interesting presence every time she was on screen with leonardo dicaprio you just kept paying attention to her and what was on like just the look on her face her eyes are able to just communicate so much 
and just the way she carries herself as an actor. Something similar that I see with um, uh, someone like uh, Daniel Kaluuya. You know, Daniel Kaluuya specifically, he has just like this gaze in his eyes that he's always able to bring something so great to these performances. So yeah, a lot of this movie does uh, does rely on how amazing Lily Gladstone is. But, you know, it's not a long movie. I just thought it was a really, a really um, touching little indie movie and, you know, just shining some light and, you know, giving like kind of a slice of life story that I really appreciate about just a culture and a part of America that I'm not very familiar with. And that's something I always love to experience in movies is just, you know, I, I say this all the time, I'm a broken record, but just slice of life stuff, just um, uh, people and a place, um, environments, um, cultures that I'm just not very familiar with and just portraying them in a very strong way and giving you a good sense of what um, these people's lives are like. Um, you know, that, that are probably being shared by a lot of different people. So, uh, yeah, just really, really appreciated a lot about it. Um, you know, nothing, nothing insanely amazing, just a really solid, uh, indie movie director, Erica Tremblay, who I believe is also a Native American director who Lily Gladstone has worked with before. Um, I mean, it looked pretty great. I had nothing, um, nothing just again just a really good portrayal um of this of this this uh this culture and this this environment uh so yeah if if you have apple tv plus not a bad thing to throw on i very much enjoyed it not too much to say honestly it was just it was just pretty good all right so next i saw saturday night I checked this one out because it's a pretty big cast of young up and coming actors, uh, some of whom that I really like. I really like uh, Rachel, Rachel Senna, uh, love Willem Dafoe, obviously, and J.K. Simmons, been around for a while. Uh, and the guy, Craig from Succession, he's playing two characters in this movie. Uh, you know, there, there's. You know, it's a big, uh, big movie. It's potential awards buzz initially when it uh, hit the festival. So, you know, went and checked it out. Um, unfortunately, I feel like y your enjoyment of this movie will rely pretty heavily on how much you personally care about SNL. And I unfortunately do not care about SNL. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of movies where, you know, there are subject matters that I'm not super familiar with, but they have very interesting stories that I wasn't aware of, you know, or, or you know, I'm just learning about something that I never really had an interest in, but this is like a gateway into saying, oh, wow, look at this. Um, I wasn't aware of any of this story. And unfortunately, Saturday Night seems like it's made for people that are already really in the know about the history of SNL or some of these people's careers, you know, I, I couldn't tell you who, I, like, I know the name Chevy Chase. I, I couldn't tell you what he looked like. I know uh, John Bellucci only from the Blues Brothers, but I mean, other than that, I, I don't know. Like, I don't hold these people in very high regard in my mind I just I don't know I, I'm not really super interested in that and, and this movie kind of almost just seems like well you had to have really cared about these people's careers to begin with the only one that I'm really a big fan of is is George Carlin uh and that was pretty cool to see someone play him in the movie um as far as it goes I mean I really appreciate the fast pace you know um nature of it you know uh, the real time trying to get on before 11:30 um you know just as the the camera is constantly whipping around and having a lot of energy and just kind of seeing all of the studio in Radio City Music Hall and just kind of the whole it's showbiz baby check it out uh <laughs> I did enjoy all of that you know I do I do think all of that stuff is interesting and you know how how does how does this big theater even occupy space within this skyscraper tower in New York City I just I always love just that, just thinking about that, the architecture. Like, this is a big 
theater stage, like occupying space in this like big New York City tower on like the God knows how many high up floor. Uh, it's just that's always I don't know the logistics of all that is just very interesting to me. And all of these just random back rooms and offices, a lot of them that don't have windows that, you know, where they're broadcasting nationally uh, to. I, I always just found that very cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it just so just the location alone, I thought was interesting, uh, you know, and some pretty good performances, I guess. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I just at the end of the day, I, I just don't really care that much about SNL. And to be honest. I don't really even find SNL to be that funny, and I understand it's definitely hard to produce a show like this every Saturday, and I guess that's commendable. And, you know, the history of, okay, they they, they, they launch the careers of all of these, um, all of the big comedy stars that we know and love today, most of them start, or just actors, they start on SNL. And I get that, and I understand there's a story to be told there. I guess just the show itself I just don't really care about it, especially in today's day and age where, look, let's be honest, I think most people would say that SNL's not really funny anymore, and I don't, I don't know, like, I just, it's one of those things, that, like, people, I've even heard people say this, uh, you know, SNL's on for, like, what, an hour and a half every Saturday night? That's a lot of show. Most SNL skits are gonna be duds. I just, I don't know, man, like, I guess it's cool that they do it live. And they try to do like this variety sketch show with musical performances. I get it. I get the vision and I respect the vision. I just don't, I don't know. I'm just not that interested. Um, maybe it's because we're, I'm just young and I just live in a time where this concept is kind of irrelevant now. And I understand there's a place to understand the history. It just seems more about honoring these these actors um and these you know comedy legends um that i'm just not super interested in <laughs> and i'm trying not to sound disrespectful or anything i just it just didn't give me a reason you know i know they're like dan Aykroyd. i know there's a lot of stuff i'm supposed to like okay th this is a thing and this is a thing and there's probably context around this and there's like probably a book exploring the background of this and there's a lot of lore right to snl um, and a lot of the dynamics and a lot of the star power and the conflicting um, egos and things like that. Billy Crystal, you know, I, these are names that I'm familiar with. I'm just not like Jim Henson. I, I just, um, and I do find Jim Henson's work very interesting. Uh, it's just, I'm just like, it's, I just, it's, there's not, it's just a fine movie. It's fine. It's fine. I didn't hate it. Um, it just wasn't, it didn't. It's not, it didn't take up too much space in my mind, you know, um, really nothing that standout-ish about it for me. And yes, there's the issue of, are they going to make it to air? You know, they're going to make it to air. I mean, I guess that's not really the point. It's more about how do they make it? And sure, it was crazy. It was, you know, it, it just, it didn't even really seem, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I guess. It's not even really, it felt like the movie wasn't super concerned with uh, showcasing the accomplishment of what they did and how hard it was. It's definitely there, that's not, but it, it seemed like the movie was more focused on showing these actors, showcasing the actors portray these old, you know, real life people um, and their old cast members. Like it was more about Oh wow, look at so and so playing Dan Aykroyd and wow, it's that guy's got sounds is doing the Chevy Chase and this guy is doing Billy Crystal and I guess I just I didn't really that wasn't really as much for me, you know? It it felt like it was more um I hate, I don't know if I could say member berries for things that I didn't really care about, but it almost felt like that. Like, oh, member member Billy Crystal, member Chevy Chase, like, ooh, look at this actor playing them, and I, and, it's, and then like with all the interpersonal stuff, it's like, ooh, this, this is Lore, this person's relationship with Lauren Michaels. It just, it seemed like the movie was a little bit more fo focused on that Lore stuff and less of the overall, just the story at hand of, hey, look at what they accomplished. Um, 
again, it's there. I just, I, I just think that was more of the pull of the movie where, where I was less interested. Uh, of course, you know, felt a lot like, um, made me, th unfortunately kind of part way through this movie. I was just like, wow, this is pretty all right. I guess I just rather be watching Birdman, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, some really long takes. I don't know if there was some trickery with the camera work of making things look like there were longer takes than they really were. Either way, I mean, it was, you know, pretty well directed. Uh, always interesting. I mean, imagine behind the scenes of this, like trying to make a movie about the production of a TV show, like the where it all takes place in a TV studio. It's always interesting to think about like what that would what that would look like behind the scenes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm totally middle of the road on it. Um, I'm not trying to try. Like, if you if you are a fan of SNL, I'm sure you will enjoy this movie um, a lot or are familiar a lot more with the lore. Uh, there's probably a lot more here for this movie uh, for you than, than there was for me. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty just middle of the road. It, it was fine. Um, it was fine. So, yeah, that's Saturday night. All right, next, I saw The Apprentice, the origin story of Donald Trump. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this director, Ali Abbasi. Yeah, never saw any of this guy's stuff. But, yeah, I was so interested to see this one, uh, specifically for Sebastian Stan and Jeremy Strong who I, I just think Sebastian Stan is on his way to an Oscar. He is so, I don't want to say low-key, I mean, that's kind of a stupid term, but he's kind of quietly just doing all of these amazing projects. I don't know if he just has a great agent, but man, he is doing such interesting work in everything. Anytime Sebastian Stan gets cast in something, you know, Marvel stuff aside, I'm always like, oh, this is going to be interesting. He picks such great projects. Um, and Jeremy Strong coming in to play Roy Cohen. What a what a great duo. Um, and, and that's here in this movie. And that's at the core of this movie is these two actors. And I I really kind of loved this movie more than I thought I was going to. Uh, you know, I'm... I'm, I was born in 95, you know, I remember in the early 2000s seeing The Apprentice, um, that's basically a lot of people, what I even feel like just most people, I know Trump, he came up in the 80s, I, I know, I feel like most people pre, you know, um, president and politics and stuff, people just pretty much knew Donald Trump as The Apprentice guy. I knew we had like Trump Tower, and I guess I didn't, I don't even really know if I knew about the casinos. They were all just featured on The Apprentice. You know, that was the extent of my knowledge of Donald Trump. He's just some, his brand was just his brand. You know, there was really nothing to it. It was just this gaudy gold power billionaire who's like a celebrity. And he's just the big businessman. And, you know, he, he had The Apprentice, the show The Apprentice. Uh, and, you know, in The Apprentice, it featured, a, like, you know, it was, you know, very heavily, you know, New York City. Um, that was the whole thing. And I'm from New York, you know, not the city, but, you know, a lot of, I really, um, I was aware of all, like, the early 2000s TV of it, like the reality show TV aspects were, were a big thing. The Apprentice was a huge show, and it went on. I didn't even realize. I know they had, like, Celebrity Apprentice spinoffs, but that show was on until 20... 2017? When was Trump elected? I, whatever, I don't know. I'm not looking that up. But um, yeah, that show went on for way longer than I think people realize. Uh, but yeah, it, it watching this movie, the way it's shot and the way it's presented, seeing like, you know, all of these, how people, I mean, a lot of it does take place in the 80s. None of this, I don't think it ever really goes into like the 2000s. But the, the aesthetics are still there where I felt like I so much of this movie, the way it was shot and the way it looks like it felt like I was watching it through like a CRT TV a lot of the time, like that old boxy TV you had in a living room and The Apprentice would be on. And it, like I, I just saw that old Donald Trump of like, uh, oh, it was just the way this movie looks and, you know, in the 
seeing Trump in the big penthouse with like the carpets and stuff. I don't know. Something about that just reminded me of seeing The Apprentice in the early 2000s in my living room as a kid. Um, it, it just evoked so much of that, which I really wasn't expecting, just the aesthetic of the movie. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and again, I that was my extent to my knowledge of Donald, Donald Trump pre-political pre stuff. And then, you know, you hear a lot more about him, about how, as the years have went on, and he's been like a main figure in culture, uh, just about like, no, his businesses were never really that big. It's just kind of like his dad was a real estate mogul that just kind of really never thought that his son lived up to expectations. And, you know, his Donald Trump kind of grew up like this, this kind of just blank slate that just really had daddy issues, you know, and was always just trying to have approval of his dad. And it's taken under his wing by Roy Cohen. And, um, this movie really explores a lot of that story and fills in a lot of those gaps of things that I wasn't aware of. Uh, now, are all of the things in this movie true? Is it exaggerated? I don't know. I choose to believe, yeah, most of this is probably true. Um, you know, maybe not dramatized the exact way, obviously, scene to scene, but I mean, like, all of the stuff about Roy Cohen with, like, the AIDS and, like, that turn. Like, I didn't know any of this stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, the 80s. I was like, wow, it's just... So much of this movie was so entertaining, um, just a really entertaining drama from start to finish and just a real exploration of this guy and how he came to be and why he is the way he is. Um, and, you know, there's kind of a there was kind of this thing of uh, humanizing Trump, I guess um, people would say, like, well, it's not going to be for people that like him and not for people that hate him. I mean. I don't like him, and this doesn't really make me feel any sympathy for him. I mean, yeah, I guess there's a reason to why everyone ticks the way they tick, um, but that doesn't make me feel sorry for him. You know, there's there's a reason why he is the way he is. I mean, to such an extent, um, to be so sociopathic to his core, you see that develop in this movie, and I think they do a great job of of getting that across of this, the kind of life this guy lived and how he came up in the 80s and how, you know, he he came into, like, this power and, and fame and, you know, what he was taught and, you know, just how he got all of this to work um, and how he became very arrogant um, with his business decisions. I just thought this was such a, an entertaining and interesting betrayal and story about this guy and how he came to be the way he is you know and and a, a kind of this movie is just as much of like a roy cohen story as it is a donald trump story it's kind of more about them together as a as a duo and and how what role roy cohen really played in trump's life and you know what a mentor he was to him uh and just, just there's so much. There's, I love oh God. I love Jeremy Strong in this movie, and and so much of it does kind of play into like. A lot of it does feel like Succession, you know. Um, obviously, Succession is loosely based on, um, you know, um, Rupert Murdoch and that family. But like, th there's a similar story here of like the power and the money and the, you know. But it's just more contained to these to this one guy, um, and just how it's a real story. Uh, and it's fascinating. I found this movie in, insanely entertaining. Jeremy Strong and Sebastian Stan make it. They make this movie so great. Um, I, I have the makeup work in this movie. Like, I don't know what they did with Sebastian Stan. I don't know how. You hear, oh, Sebastian Stan's going to play a young Trump. What? That doesn't make sense at all. There must have been, like, some subtle makeup magic that they did to make you really believe oh yeah i could yeah i see it i mean obviously the wig is a big part but something with the cheekbones and something stands doing just his mannerisms and i love the way that he doesn't go full into the impression of trump from the beginning he's in the beginning of the movie he's not really the trump that you know today you know he's a much younger version of trump you don't really he plays it so well i mean god i one of the best performances I've seen all year, honestly, because you really, and it's not in your face. It is kind of subtle, 
I think, I mean, again, I think because we're exposed to so much of Trump these days, you, you really are familiar with all of his very distinct mannerisms and his speech patterns. Uh, you see in the movie, and I think this movie uses that to its benefit because it doesn't have to be in your face about it. It's, it, it does seem subtle. We're just so hyper aware of how Trump is that we can pick up on it. Um, you know, years down the line, like future generations might not, you know, um, understand how spot on these, these, uh, these mannerisms and the way that Stan plays this, uh, you know, because they won't be as familiar with how Trump was, but, uh, you know, the way he subtly moves in to talking more like, like Trump and behaving more like Trump, the way the movie goes on, you see him grow into that person. And I, and I think they do it, they do it fantastically. I like it's, I mean, and that's the thing too. There's some over the topness in these performances with Jeremy Strong and Sebastian Stan. It almost feels like they're, I don't know how to explain it. Um, it doesn't even feel like they're really trying. It almost feels like they're just having fun with it. Like they're kind of playing into what outlandish, gaudy, over the top people they are. Because to an extent, I guess they really were in real life or they are in real life. Uh, but it doesn't feel like they're like, you know, like they're Daniel Day Lewising it. Like this is a very like method actory thing. I mean, Jeremy Strong's a psychopath, but it just felt like they just. They just got. They just did it so effortlessly, and they kind of were just having fun with it. But be, but the result is like this super entertaining and extremely watchable movie that I just I thought was fantastic. It's two hours long, kind of flies by. I also love um, uh, Maria Akhlova, the one that plays Ivana Trump. Um, and again, back history with that that I wasn't aware of. Um, she was the daughter in Borat 2 and is getting some more roles. Uh, she was in Bodies, 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 which I loved her in. And God, she is beautiful. Um, but she was really good in the movie too. I mean, yeah, this... Uh, I, I, I was not expecting to love this movie as much as I did. Um, this is one of the higher ones on my list this year. Um, I mean, mainly because there aren't a ton of like amazing movies that i've seen this year but this one i was like damn this i i really and again so much of it goes to the acting um these two actors um i was like yep i i fucking loved this movie um and just as a filling in these gaps and being a time capsule and again maybe part of it is just due because we have this election coming up so soon and we're so hyper aware of trump going back and examining his life in this very entertaining succession style way uh i just i was maybe it's just the times um but you know just as a time capsule i was thinking wow this is really interesting this story um and how this this came to be um so yeah i mean really really high up on my list for the movies i've seen this year i was i was really surprised to be honest i didn't think i was gonna really uh love this movie as much as i did but um, and I'm going to have to look out for this director's work because he did a really great job. And uh, yeah, can't can't recommend this one enough. This was a big win this past week. The Apprentice was not was not expecting that. I mean, but I'm just so in these actors camp, Sebastian Stan and Jeremy Strong. Uh, yeah, they can they can they can almost do no wrong. They always I always trust them when they're when they're on in these projects. So, uh, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic, The Apprentice. <sighs> All right, moving right along. Next, I saw Terrifier 3. Oh, man. It's here, folks. Terrifier 3. It's a big phenomenon, and I'm here for it. I love Art the Clown. I am all in on these Terrifier movies. Now, are all of them great? Not really, uh, <laughs> but I think there's memorable things in each one of them. I think this third one is the best one. I think they just get better and better. I, I remember rating the first Terrifier movie pretty low, but that was mainly because it was just so long 
And I think Terrifier 2 is even longer. I think that's the longest one, like over two hours long, which, you know, any good horror fan would know, especially in the slasher genre. This is a 90-minute uh, format you're doing. You don't do two-hour-long slasher movies. I mean, this is just, just not a not par for the course normally. But, yeah, um, I just think, you know, I just, what I love about slashers is I don't think they're, you know, I don't see them as regular horror movies. I think slashers are, you know, for my taste, they have kind of an over-the-top, almost ridiculous, almost comedic edge to them. Uh, whereas the kills are so over the top and so insane in so many cases that I think that's where I find myself not getting too grossed out where I'm like, okay, this is to the, this is to the point where now they're just, they're just playing with guts. They're just, you know, um, playing with props to see like, there's a, there's an arc to it to see how fucked up and how insane the kills can be. There was an insane kill in, um, in a violent nature from earlier this year that was pretty memorable to be like oh wow i didn't see that before but they're just such insane outlandish kills you know that they're not even that believable it's more just oh wow what's the most fucked up and insane body horror way we can find to kill someone you know um when it comes to things like i don't know torture stuff like saw like those are the movies that type of stuff is where i can't handle it you know with this stuff it's more like there's almost a a grindhouse type of vibe to these movies uh, where they're supposed to be a little they're meant to be over the top and meant to be ridiculous um and that's where the fun is and and i just like i like the grindhouse nature of movies like this um would you call them grindhouse movies yeah maybe not i think that i think slashers are a little different but but i think they're in the same you can there are a lot of you know there are a lot of um, overlapping similarities there in tone and in execution. Uh, what I what I love so much about Terrifier three is I think there are v much more memorable moments in this one. The idea of making it a Christmas story, and that's what I think Art the Clown, why he makes for such a great horror villain is you know the whole idea is that he's 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 like a mime you know he doesn't speak and he emotes and the performance of uh you know whatever his name is um what is his name david Le damian leone is the director art the clown is david howard thornton um yeah he's great in these movies um such a physical performance like literal he's literally playing a mime where he has to give all these facial expressions and what i love about art the clown is you kind of just see things from his perspective a lot of the time in these movies you see him like going to figure out like his next like all right how do i fucking kill these people like you see him like just take i i will never not laugh at seeing art the clown like just get on a bus or get on a subway with like a <laughs> fucking <laughs> garbage bag full of like torture tools or body parts and he just like sits on the He's just like a, I love that we see things from his perspective. Like he'll get annoyed with like his sidekick. He's, he's, he's literally a cartoon character. Um, and that's what I find so amusing about his character. Um, it just, just the opening scene in this movie, Terrifier 3 was such gold. It was such gold. <laughs> when, when he goes into the kid's room, they're like, Julian, I told you not to come into my room. And you just hear, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I laughed so hard. Oh, it's just so funny. It's like, there's, there's a certain comedic tone that this thing hits where it just makes me laugh. Uh, or the scene in the mall um, in this movie is one of the best bits in the Terrifier movies. That made me laugh so hard. It's like, at this point, Art the Clown, he's not even, like, a slasher villain. In that scene, he was just a domestic terrorist. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> oh, I find... I just... I am on the wavelength of so much of this movie. And, you know, there's, like, the standard kind of 
not that interesting human characters and like the storyline going on. It's fine. It's serviceable. What I find interesting about these Terrifier movies, because this one very much ties into the second Terrifier movie, I think the final, final girl in this movie wasn't even in the first movie. I think the first movie was like just completely different characters, just introducing Art the Clown as, a, as an entity. Uh, but there's like this whole other thing going on with these movies, like almost like this subplot thing with the humans where the main girl is like, has this sword that she has like these valkyrie like superpowers when she gets this sword that can defeat art and there's like the girl that like there's there's people that are like arts um like sidekicks in these two movies and in this one it's like like a zombie girl that like can speak and is talking a lot in this movie and there's like all of this other super supernatural there's like another dimension like another realm in these movies that I guess like art is from, but it's funny when they go into that stuff, especially in the third act of this movie, uh, there's like all of this stuff about like this sword that gives this girl powers and this other dimension that I'm sure they're going to discuss more in the, in the next movie, you know, it's going to be explored more, but I just find it kind of amusing that when all of this is going on, it feels like all of this stuff is kind of completely detached from art like the girl the his evil sidekick girl is doing all the talking and there's all this stuff with this sword and this evil dimension stuff and it feels like none of this really like i guess art is from this other dimension but he just seems like he doesn't give a shit about any of this stuff he's just like standing there in the corner in the third act of this movie like no i'm just trying to fucking kill people like a cartoon villain like i don't i don't what what is all this other stuff with this sword and these valkyrie powers like i don't even know what's going on with that stuff and i don't think art does either which i just found very funny uh so yeah the, so much to love in this movie the bar scene just where he's just fucking with people and there's it's just comedy man it just art is a very a, he's not michael myers he doesn't look like you just get to spend time with him just fuck with people before he kills them not even in a torturous way. It's just, he's he's like genuinely excited to see Santa Claus. Uh, and then the shower scene, which was like a, a legit uh, slasher movie scene. They're like, there are some parts where I got to kind of look away a little bit. And I'm like, oh God, this is what they're doing with this kill. Ooh, okay. Um, but pretty quickly, it's just, okay, this person is not even like, this person is so mangled um, and dead. It's not even a this is a guy just playing with flesh at this point. And there are parts where I'm like, okay, I can't really handle that. But you, you try to tell yourself, okay, it's just, it's just like, like he's, he's playing. It, there's a, there's supposed to, it's supposed to be so over to the top. I think I'm, I'm trying to get on the slasher fan wavelength a little bit with this stuff. Um, so there are a lot of those thrills. Uh, yeah, there, there was something else in this movie, but I, I think, or I was going to say, I think the second terrifier movie there's a whole scene in a bedroom. I think that was the one that had me like squirm the most. But other than that, um, you know, there's brutal, gory slasher stuff. But again, I think it's just so over the top. I think there's supposed to be like a cartoony element to this stuff. And I know that's kind of weird to say when it's like m massacring people and cutting them up. But I don't know. There's like a weird tone and art to it. No pun intended. Uh but yeah, and then when it when it starts playing, it's a terrifier Christmas. I was like, oh yes, yes, I'm on this movie's level. Uh, again, just really giving me those grindhouse vibes, uh, you know. But but in the form of like a legit slasher movie. Um, so yeah, this was this was one of the stronger movies I've seen this year. Again, it's too long. These movies aren't amazing. Uh, mainly, it's. Mainly, I, I go for the, there's memorable bits in each one of them, and I think this movie has the most of it. Um, I think this movie being a Christmas movie, I think they use that a lot to um, its benefit. I think they could have done more with it, but I think they do a pretty good job of just art wanting to be Santa Claus. <laughs> it works so well. Uh, so yeah, it's such a great character. I, I, love, I love these Terrifier movies. Um, I can't wait for another one. Um, just like a midnight movie, just such a fun midnight movie thing, you know? Um, so yeah, that is, that's Terrifier 3. Um, you know, it's, it's up there with one of the better things I've seen this year. It's different.
it's it's scratching an itch of a genre that we don't see a lot of big productions out of so really really excited about this franchise so yeah that's terrifier 3 best one out of the best one out of the trilogy uh out of the series so far all right so next i saw rumors um or rumors this is a, a movie i saw the trailer and i thought it looked really good like some sort of political satire horror movie in the trailer it directly you know states that it's basically meant to be um what was it night of the living dead uh mixed with uh dr strange love and okay um you know but the trailer looked really good uh starring kate blanchett and a bunch of other actors that i'm not super familiar with um the lannister guy from game of thrones he's here uh so yeah i, I went and checked it out thought it would you know be something different and just looked like a really interesting premise um and it is an interesting premise i guess i'm just this movie never clicked with me uh it's it's kind of like this like this political satire we live in a world where basically there's this g7 summit every year where the world leaders get together from all of these various countries and in this case there's a big world crisis going on that is never super clear what it is um but they're they're coming together to uh you know discuss it and you know work work to a solution and i was trying for a lot of this movie to get on its wavelength and understand what they were going for and i guess right when i started to think okay basically yes it's all meant to be these world leaders are uh you know stupid these single people that are in power are not going to save us they're all just a bunch of idiots just like the rest of us with their own personal problems um and you know and but which which i was like okay but that's not really how you know nations are ran like there's big groups uh, and cabinets and administrations of people it's not just whatever um that aside but then i started to think and then there was a point where a character literally pretty much said it where okay and then i was like okay i, I guess this makes sense where no it's more supposed to be each of these world leaders are meant to be literal personifications of the country they represent uh which that doesn't even really track because the guy the game of thrones guy who's you know um meant to be the the u.s president is they're they're clowning on joe biden where he's just a senile old man and he's falling asleep all the time and you know and uh certain aspects of things that he says is you know kind of can be a little bit uh i guess reflective of americans and american culture but and i guess some of it was just kind of stereotyping about other countries or maybe what americans think about other countries canada is a big character in this movie with their prime minister and i don't i just don't like and i'm like well maybe i'm just not is would can do canadians watch this movie and go oh yep that's justin trudeau or oh yeah this is this is definitely what canadians are like and you know that just didn't really is it meant to more represent the person that they currently have in power or is it meant to represent the people as a whole or both and i just never really was you know threading that needle too much throughout the movie um as they go through this uh like they're walking through the woods like maybe the world is ending or something or i don't know and there everyone's abandoned them and it's just them in the woods these all these world leaders um completely on their own and uh yeah there's all this stuff like this uh you know um uh science fiction stuff with like these zombie monsters that are just kind of lurking around and like this big giant brain which i just none of it was really clicking for me part of it is like i was just thinking am i just not getting it and maybe that's the case you know or maybe i'm just not getting it um but then it's like well i don't know like japan is represented in this movie but that character doesn't 
do anything in the movie. So if I'm trying to look at this from the Japanese perspective, is this, it's clearly just made, I guess, for American audiences and maybe Canadian audiences, but um, yeah, I mean, Kate Blanchett is fantastic um, it, with the character she's playing, but yeah, so much of it. Um, I guess there could have been so many more interesting conversations throughout the dialogue here uh, between world leaders, but a lot of it just falls on like their their personal problems in their personal lives. Then it gets into like things about pedophiles, like with a chat bot, like that they implemented. That was kind of funny. I don't know. It just there's a little. I I, I just felt like this movie just didn't. Unless I just, again, there was just things that I'm not getting. I was trying to look up reviews for this movie. It just came out, but there's not many. I want to read to see, like, what other people are taking away from this. But it just never really clicked with me. The whole thing with the giant brain, I was thinking, okay, I'm just, I just don't. I'm, 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 the whole time during this movie, I was trying to just think, like, what is it, what is it trying to, to be? And then when the when the one character just flat out says they're basically meant to be representations of their own countries again it still wasn't really clear okay are you meant to represent this person's culture or the people as a whole like and then what what about the, the like there's certain countries that don't do anything indicative of any kind of culture or any representation of their current leaders i don't know it's all just very I just felt like this movie had a decent premise and then what it ended up doing, like there was one or two little chuckles out of me, but a lot of it, I just kind of ended up getting kind of bored because I'm thinking, okay, now I'm just, I'm just not getting on its wavelength and I'm just not understanding it. And maybe that's on me. Maybe I'll read something and it'll totally change my perception of what it was going for and what it was trying to do. But I mean, clearly, I was I, I understood that it was meant to be a giant satire. That's clear, um, you know, with with the musical cues and certain things and the tones. Um, I understood pretty quickly. OK, it's a massive satire. Um, I just <clears throat> I just I just wasn't getting on its wavelength. Uh, so, yeah, so unfortunately, that made the whole experience kind of boring for me. And then by the end, there's a big thing where it's just like, yep they're all just gonna kill us and you know they're all just idiots just like the rest of us and our world leaders are idiots and isn't that sucky aren't they just gonna lead us all to doom and it's like yes but it it's it, 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 it just read hollow to me it was very hollow and it's like well in these two hours you really didn't i felt like there wasn't really anything communicated other than that you know, it took two hours of just them roaming around in the woods and just a bunch of really weird, vague symbolism of things that I wasn't understanding that, yeah, again, just unfortunately just didn't click with me. It, it was pretty, it was pretty, uh, yeah, no one's really talking about this movie and I guess I can, I can see why. I mean, some of the people I follow on Letterboxd gave it okay ratings, uh, you know, because again, I'm trying to find people that got it or were like, oh, on its wavelength and it clicked for them because, yeah, I mean, there's like some decent lighting, um, you know, cool color lighting in the woods. But other than that, I mean, there was really nothing impressive about this movie. Um, and all the zombie stuff was just like, you know, shit posty, you know, they're like jerking off and stuff. And I just, I don't know. Um, yeah, um, if someone wants to comment and say what they got out of it, but I, I just, I just got a very hollow, like, yeah, they're, they're gonna, they're all idiots, and they're gonna bring the end of the world, and I was like, yes, I, I get it, I, I understand, but the way you, the, the way you went about communicating that message was very ineffective <laughs> in this satire, so. Yeah, that's that's rumors. And I really don't understand the the meaning of the title. Um, I really want to look into the meaning of the title too. like I want to get it. I want to see if like I can understand a little bit more from a from a perspective that liked this movie. Uh, but yeah, nope, just just unfortunately did not click with me. So yeah, uh, that's rumors.